the Department of Justice is effectively telling the whistleblower you're not covered, yeah. which means that there is a real risk even in coming to Congress, and that is obviously a supreme problem. Uh, I would love to be able to say that the president won't be vindictive, uh, that the Justice Department won't be vindictive, but I can't make that assurance if the Department of Justice is taking the position you're not covered. Uh, and, you know, the, the people who do come forward, they're assured that if they do, their complaint will get to Congress. Uh, and so a lot is riding on this. If those promises are hollow, then it means these important sources of information about wrongdoing are going to dry up. The stakes could not be any higher. The risk to his career or her career and reputation and perhaps legal standing could not be any higher for this whistleblower. That's why we're glad to be joined by MSNBC national security analyst and former chief of staff at both the CIA and the Department of Defense, someone I've wanted to talk to about this story all week, Jeremy Bash. Jeremy. Hey, Nicole. Assuming the reports are true, I see three crimes here. One is extortion by the president, which is basically using a threat, a threat of withholding aid to obtain something of value. A second crime is conspiracy to engage in extortion between the president and Rudy Giuliani. A third crime is conspiracy to violate federal election law between the president and Rudy Giuliani to obtain federal foreign interference in the United States election. So given that there may be three underlying crimes here, I think we're beyond the issue of the whistleblower, because the whistleblower mm -hmm. issue was really about surfacing all of this, bringing it to the attention of a Congress so Congress could investigate. I think Congress now will begin a thorough and comprehensive investigation. And this is going to go to the courts because it's going to turn on executive privilege. And on July 24, 1974, the United States Supreme Court ruled in U.S. versus Richard Nixon that a president could not shield those infamous audio tapes if they were potentially evidence of criminal activity by claiming executive privilege. Jeremy, can we take those one at a time? Extortion. Yeah, extortion is basically threatening somebody uh, and saying, if you don't give me something, I'm going to harm you. And effectively what the president of the United States said to the president of Ukraine was, if you don't give me uh, what I want, which is support in, uh, in, in my presidential election, I'm going to withhold uh, American military support. And every diplomatic engagement is a quid pro quo. It's not an issue of whether it's a quid pro quo. Everything is a bargain, a transaction. The question is, what is being offered and what is being received? Let me take you through this idea then of, of a campaign finance violation, because we've been down this road before. Donald Trump's already an unindicted co-conspirator in a legal campaign finance scheme that the Southern District of New York investigated. Yeah, and I think here it's even a little uh, clearer because obviously he and Rudy Giuliani uh, discussed and a conspiracy is simply an agreement by two people to engage in a criminal act and, and they have to take an overt act, a specific act in furtherance of the conspiracy. They engage in a, a meeting of the minds to have Rudy Giuliani go to Ukraine and uh, obtain a foreign interference in the United States election to benefit Donald Trump. Let, let me just ask you, I, I started this with, with Halman Dump, trying to dumb this story down because I think there is a fatigue. How could Robert Mueller have investigated Donald Trump's ties to Russia, found 150 ties, found 10 criminal acts of obstruction of justice after the Southern District of New York found criminal uh, campaign finance violations? How, how do we stand at the precipice of another potentially criminal impeachable act by this president? I don't know, Nicole. Hey, I, I'm I'm not so into the fatigue narrative. I think that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If this is important, if this is a constitutional matter, I think we should talk about it, and I think members of Congress will. What would you advise advise Joe Biden to do? He didn't engage today. Was that a mistake? Uh, I think he should, you know, stay low. I don't think he needs to engage. And I think if he wants to point something out, it's that the president of the United States uh, is engaging in conduct unbecoming the office and abuse of power. And that's part of the rationale for, uh, for uh, the Biden campaign. Jeremy Bash, I love you for a lot of reasons, but not buying into the fatigue one is at the top of my <laughs> list today. Thank you for jumping on the phone with us, my friend. Karina, I, I, I want to put this, this back to you because Jeremy makes it so clear um, so clear. And, and, and I'm going to record that and, and send it out because I haven't heard it put out with that clarity, with that strength, with that determination to seek and obtain justice for the American taxpayer and the American public for many elected Democrats yet.
Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Look, we should not be numb to this. We should not never become numb to what Donald Trump is doing because it's not just that he's um, attacking the norms or breaking norms. He's literally th like throwing a wrecking ball into our democracy, and we can't be numb to this. And somebody else said something. I can't remember if it was Heilman or, or you. Um, it, is that what Donald Trump is doing? He doesn't care about the legal aspect. He doesn't care about being in the courts. He cares about the political play here, the political game, and that's what is. That's what's really kind of engaging him. He's going to the gutter because this is the way that he believes that he could win, and it's incredibly nasty. And that's what Democrats also have to be ready for. Like, how do you take on Donald Trump, who is going to take it to the lowest of the lows, but at the same time, you've got to continue fighting, and you can't be numb to this. All right, on the lowest of the low, I want to hear from Michael Steele and John Hallman. It's a conversation we've been having in the breaks, but go, go ahead and say, and, and I've just been handed a new story what, in the Washington Post. What do you want to Talk about. about where this fight's going to be wait oh well we've got let me let me read you yeah. we got some more information to yeah. put into the system this is just like old days guys just been handed breaking news in the washington post donald trump pressed the ukrainian leader to investigate biden's son according to people familiar with the matter washington post seemingly matching the wall street journal scoop from the top of the hour let me read a couple paragraphs from this president trump pressed the leader of ukraine to investigate the son of former vice president joe biden in a call between the two leaders that is at the center of an extraordinary whistleblower complaint, according to two people familiar with the matter. Trump used the July 25th conversation with Ukraine President Zelensky to pressure the recently elected leader to more aggressively pursue an investigation that Trump believed would deliver potential political dirt against one of the president's political adversaries, the people said. So what the Post has built on from the journal reporting is tying the request of investigating Biden to the whistleblower complaint and also giving us a date, a point in time on July 25th. The significance of that would be that three days later, DNI Coates resigned and, and insisted that his deputy, Sue Gordon, resign with him. You think unrelated coincidence? Not that likely, um, an unrelated coincidence. It seems, I, I think that, you know, the, the, I, we're getting to the end of the show and there's so much to talk about here, but I do think that as just this process of this reporting, yeah. The, all these these reporters, these newspapers, as they have been throughout the Trump administration, are so on their game. And I think that right now, watching the magic of the New York Times, Amazing. Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, building incremental on each, each stories, this is whether we get all the way to some explicit quid pro quo, uh, around the back quid pro quo, a side quid pro quo, or an implicit. This is a story that has enormous potential national security and political implications. And what you see right now is the way the White House is behaving in the middle of it, which is, you know, I suggested before that they have a playbook, but they are clearly uncomfortable. And they have been for the last 48 hours. They continue to be uncomfortable with this because I think they recognize that if this goes in a certain direction, and I do continue to think that there's a place over which this becomes, Nancy Pelosi goes, I'm sorry, I don't want to do impeachment, but I have to now. And, the, and this story could get there. And so they're going to fight to try to keep it from getting there. This, as the details pile in, we're going to see whether it gets there. But we could get there, and that, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of stakes we're talking about right and now. And, Michael Steele, the thing that would get them there a lot faster would be if there's a single bleeping Republican in the entire <laughs> Congress <laughs> with a conscience or a soul. Where do you put the odds of that? Elvis has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> none? You don't think Richard Burr? I mean, I'm old enough to remember no, when, when no. Portman had a soul. I mean, none of them gone AWOL? I think they're. I think they're going to sit back uh, on their heels on this and kind of wait uh, to to John's point. On this, to see Michael how, Steele. On yeah, this, what, President what, Trump pressed Nicole, the leader of Ukraine to investigate the son Nicole, of. Nicole, we're 48 hours into this story. Who have you heard from, even inquisitively? They all have so, my cell phone number. Not one. It's a good point. I, who have we? I haven't. I have no one. And I talked to a lot of them. No, I haven't heard a thing. You haven't heard a thing. No one's like, here's a little background. This is what we're concerned about. No one's come out and said, okay, look, you know, this is serious here, Mr. President. Let's, let's walk this through and see where we are. And this takes me back to the point of the discussion um, before the breaking news. Um, and that is, I think we are kind of uh, immune to this. We're, we are kind of sort of sitting back. I, I don't see the outrage publicly. Um, by anything that this president has been doing. So we'll see.